Okay. The subject of today's talk is the painful collapsed or flat foot. And the reason that we don't have a good title for this talk is that there isn't a good definition for the term flat foot or collapsed foot. The subtitle is how did the flat foot get there and what should we do about it? So there are a lot of questions about flat feet. Most of them we don't have answers for. First, what makes a foot flat? Why does it hurt? How do we evaluate it? What are the treatment options? And what are the most common questions patient asks? So these are the questions that patients seem to ask most frequently. Is this genetic? Are there some exercises I can do to prevent the need for surgery? If I do need surgery, how long do I need to be in the hospital? How long do I need to be on crutches? How long do I need to wear a cast? And how long do I need to be off work? So we'll try to answer a little bit of those as we go. The last year I was a resident, 1986, the treatment for adult painful flat foot was lose weight, wear a University of California Biomechanics Laboratories insole, sit down more often, and quit complaining. And if you didn't have success with those four treatment techniques, we'd do a triple arthrodesis and put you in a cast for a very long time. And in those days, we did very little to guarantee that a triple arthrodesis was done in a good position. And it didn't often solve the patient's problems that they presented to you with. So we don't know a lot about it scientifically. We know that it looks flat to someone, and we know that it hurts. But we don't have a good definition. We don't know what causes it to be flat. We don't know what causes pain in a foot that's flat and why some are painful and some are not. We don't know how many types of flat foot there are. We don't know which feet become symptomatic, and we don't really know the best treatment. One thing that's widely accepted, and I think almost everyone will agree, is that flat foot without equinus is usually not a problem. The vast majority of people with flat feet have no medical problems, don't need any treatment, they don't need orthotics, they don't need exercises, they don't need a surgeon. And the best study on the subject is an old one. It's over 50 years old. And during World War II, Harrison Beeth in Toronto looked at all the Canadian recruits for World War II. In those days, they used to turn recruits away if they had flat feet. But in the World War II, they weren't turning people away for very many things. And they followed those patients who had previously been turned away and found that in the absence of a tight heel cord, or in their words, contracture of the triceps surrey, a flat foot is within the normal contour of the stable foot and not the result of weakness. So this was the first study that really looked to see if flat foot itself was a problem and found most of the time it's not. It's only a problem if there's a tight heel cord. So you can ask why a foot gets flat, but the alternative is to ask why a foot's not flat. If you take your hand and push it down on the top of a table, it flattens out completely, and it's an analogous anatomic structure to the foot. So there are things that keep the foot from flattening out in the way the hand does, and those things are bony and ligamentous structures like the plantar fascia and the spring ligament, and some dynamic supports like the pull of the perineus longus and the tibialis posterior. But those things don't fire during quiet standing. The tibialis posterior does not fire when you're standing with your foot on the ground. It only fires in early heel rise. So the majority of the orthotic management strategies that are designed to compensate for an incompetent posterior tibial tendon really aren't very well thought out. So the critical soft tissues that we know of, at least, are the triceps causing a deformity. So if your calf is tight, it pulls up on the heel, and the foot's more likely to collapse. The posterior tibial tendon and the perineus longus provide dynamic support. And the spring ligament and Lisfranc ligament keep the arch from collapsing in the same way that an igloo is blocked from collapsing by tethering of the underside of the chunks of ice. The tibialis posterior and the perineus longus plantar flex the first ray. This is a three-dimensional CT model of a cavus foot with overpull of the first ray. And if you look here where the arrow is, you can see that something is pulling this first metatarsal down beyond where it should be relative to cuneiform. You should not see a step off at the top of the cuneiform. And if you look at what happens on this little video clip, to the perineus longus muscle as you plantar flex and dorsiflex the first ray, you can see how much excursion there is in that perineus longus. It's a relatively powerful plantar flexor, the first ray. And if it pulls, then the arch is much likely to collapse. We don't have a very good definition of what a flat foot is. This is a patient of mine who had very, very flat feet. The right side, which is on your left, had no pain at all. And you can see if you look at arch parameters, the relative width of the heel contact and the midfoot contact would easily classify this as a very flat foot. 
On the other hand, if you look at the lateral border of the foot along this line, it's not abducted. It's right in the weight-bearing line. This one has no pain. This foot, on the other hand, is very painful. And if you draw those same white lines, you see that the foot is drifting out of the weight-bearing line of the foot. And not unusual for middle-aged flat-footed patients, the patient has substantial girth that contributes to the overly uh, oppressive weight on that hind foot. And this is what the patient looks like when viewed from behind. This is the leg coming down and the heel drifting out. And if you look at the, imagine the body weight following this line down to the foot, you can see that there's a lot of torque pushing that heel outward. This is that same foot when viewed from above. Again, looking down the tibia, the foot is abducted substantially. And when you look at it from the inside, you can see that the, there's virtually no arch at all as the foot flattens right out on a piece of glass like the hand would. There are a lot of radiographic definitions of flat foot. This is a recreation of, an article, of a diagram from Nunley's article in Journal of Pediatrics. The, the number one thing to look for is the line down the axis of the talus. That should pass down the axis of the first metatarsal. I think Dr. Hansen told me about 20 years ago that all you really have to look at to determine if a foot is flat is the relationship between the talus and the first metatarsal. And this is an axis that Miri described 40 years ago in the French literature. Another radiographic finding that's important and what we found is the most sensitive indicator of correction and of collapse is the talonavicular coverage angle. This is a talus bone drawn in and this is the navicular. On a flat foot, the navicular drifts laterally and superiorly away from the head of the talus. And you can draw an axis that defines the edge of the articular cartilage of both and, a, and an axis plumb to it. And there's an angle in here that defines the talonavicular coverage angle right in this axis here and it's shown on the side as well. So if you look at a whole lot of flat feet, you'll find that they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. So each of these is a flat foot and each of them is completely different. So I think it's important not to talk about flat foot as if it's a disease, but talk about the anatomic structures that are abnormal. So on the first foot on your top left corner, there's a sag at the talonavicular joint. The one below it has a perfectly normal talonavicular joint, but a sag at the naviculocuneiform joint. On the next one at the top right corner, all of the sag is between the first metatarsal and the cuneiform. And on the one in the bottom right corner, there's a gradual sag all along the whole foot with no real standout sag at any one joint. And each of these clinically has an abnormal talometatarsal axis. Same if you look at a top view or an AP view of the foot, each one of these is a flat foot, but each one has its abnormal alignment in a different location. So if we come to this side, which you can see a lot better than I can from where you're sitting, there's a gradual erosion of the talonavicular coverage and a pretty big significant naviculocuneiform abnormality. On, the, on this one, there's an abnormal calcaneal cuboid joint with subluxation here on this side of the foot, as well as uncoverage of the talonavicular coverage angle here. This one on the third is entirely coming from Lisfranc's joint. And this one, the final one, has a gradual change throughout the whole midfoot without a specific spot leading to the flat foot. So again, there isn't a diagnosis, there isn't a term we can use to describe all these feet, and it's best just to look at the anatomic problems that each one causes. So a few pretty smart people have looked at whether we can actually diagnose this based on clinical exam or on radiographic evaluation. So Charlie Saltzman looked at 14 different radiographic parameters and found none of them was really terribly reliable to determine if a foot is flat or not. Cowan looked at, took a bunch of clinicians and had them look at feet and say, is this a flat foot or not a flat foot? And the correlation coefficient was only 0.57. So you take 100 people, they only agree, 100 ex examinations, only 57 of the times they actually agree with one another. Radiographically, the talonavicular coverage angle is most sensitive. So it's a little worrisome that we don't have a good term to describe it and we don't have good agreement among clinicians to define the problem. So we set out a few years ago to try to make this a little bit clearer by creating computer models of these deformities. And the way this was done by obtaining a simulated weight-bearing CT scan, we created outlines of the bones on two-dimensional images, then we stacked these two-dimensional images into three-dimensional models and added ligaments and cartilage. And this is a 
one clip taken out of a video clip of the foot rate bearing. And this is a flat foot CT on your upper left. So here's the talus, calcaneus, navicular, cuneiform, and first metatarsal. You can see that in this particular case, there's a gap at the cuneiform first metatarsal, and a talometatarsal angle drawn down this way would show a clear relationship, a clearly abnormal Mary's angle. A top view shows it again. Now here we're looking at talus in light blue, navicular is in purple, calcaneus is underneath the talus in red, and a line drawn down the axis of the talus doesn't come anywhere near the first metatarsal, showing substantial abduction in this case. And just for comparison, the foot on the right, on your right, is a cavus foot with the same type of com with CT generated model, showing the axis this time going all the way to the third metatarsal, the opposite kind of deformity. So the question remains, can we define flat foot in a way that makes some sense? So we took some of these 3D models to try to answer that question. We took 40 subjects and placed them into groups that were flat foot, cavus foot, and neutrally aligned foot. We did simulated weight-bearing CT scans on them to create these 3D volume maps of the bones. And for the non-engineers, we let the computer assign an axis by a process called inertial matrices, basically just using the volume of the bone to determine what its longest axis was, a second volume of the bone to determine an axis perpendicular for the second longest axis, and then the third of the three orthogonal axes was assigned by the computer. So we didn't tell it what to do. We just said, find the axes, here are the bones, here are the feet that are flat, here are the feet that are not flat. And then we used a statistical tool called the classification tree analysis, which most orthopedic surgeons know nothing about, including myself. But basically it allows the computer to randomly assign patients into categories based on these inertial matrices that they assign. And to our surprise and delight, 62 of the 64 feet were classified correctly by passive computation. So basically just by saying here's Mary's angle assigned by a computer, we're classifying them right. So it sounds like the clinicians are a little bit smarter than we've been giving ourselves credit for because the computer can almost completely recreate what we've done just by looking at the shapes of the bones. So this is just how the, this is a fifth metatarsal bone and this is one that has had this computer generated orthogonal axis attached. And here's uh, one example of a flat foot with the talus in dark blue and the first metatarsal in gray showing a drift of the forefoot away from the long axis of the talus. And these are just three examples of a cavus foot. Again, here's the talus bone and here's the first metatarsal showing that this right foot is very adducted. Here's a neutral foot showing the axis of the first metatarsal going right along the axis of the talus. And here's a flat foot showing the axis of the talus passing medially to the first metatarsal, just as we would have predicted. So now we know we're not so bad, the Mary's angle actually works, and that the things we thought were important are actually thought to be important by the computer as well. The, the 